details. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate. From all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories. Make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel. Right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. No spin, no bias, no censorship. I'm Dan Wooten tonight. After Boris Johnson made this welcome announcement today. It is my expectation that we will be able to end the last domestic restrictions, including the legal requirement to self-isolate if you test positive, a full month early. Our national nightmare of freedom destroying COVID regulations is nearly over and I'll explain why it must never be repeated in my digest plus. Why is Christopher Whitty gone missing? Then my superstar panel give their view. Tonight I'm joined by Daily Mail star columnist Amanda Patel, the publican and social media sensation Adam Brooks and the political and royal commentator Daisy McAndrew. Health Minister Gillian Keegan will welcome the end of isolation as she's forced to apologise for attending a meeting while COVID positive. But would you be happy to let the infected mix freely in society? Social media sensation Zuby and broadcaster Bev Turner both think it's time we let people get on with their lives. But Dot Medic, Dr. David Strain, has branded the PM an idiot for scrapping enforced isolation. They'll duke it out in the clash at 10.20. The Freedom Convoy has sparked positive, peaceful protests around the world. The latest is in New Zealand. So are the Globe's truckers going to be our unlikely saviours from COVID tyranny? The original Canadian Convoy spokesman, Benjamin Dichter, joins me for an exclusive interview to talk about their fight against Trudeau and how they've inspired the honking heard around the world. Don't miss that. As Chancellor Rishi Sunak's top aide outrageously claims Northern workers should accept lower wages than lavish Londoners, why should your right to earn a decent living be impacted by where you live. GB News' very own Geordie Darren Grimes is disgusted by this levelling up defeatism and he'll fight for the North and the Outsider at 9.45. The Queen's blessing seems to have helped future Queen concert Camilla's popularity soar. But will the public ever admire her as much as Princess Diana? Royal biographer Robert Jobson joins me from Dubai, where he's awaiting Prince William's inaugural visit to the UAE. He'll give his expert view at 9.45. As the government calls for comedian Jimmy Carr to be cancelled for his Holocaust joke, are we in danger of becoming a censorship state like China? Close to the bone, gags like that would be illegal under a terrifying new law which would also criminalise so-called COVID disinformation. Silky Carlo of Big Brother Watch is fighting back against the bill she describes as one of the greatest threats to the UK's free speech and living memory and she'll be uncancelled 
at 10.40. Despite their faux outrage over the PM Savile comments and the Starmer hate mob, are Labour the ones really responsible for putting poison into politics? I say yes. Plus, should the Brits and all other awards show abandon their gender neutral plans after being called out by Adele last night, who's now, can you believe this, been accused by lefties of being a turf? Please, we'll tackle those topics and give you a first look at tomorrow's front pages in the media buzz from 10. And of course, a brand new Greatest Britain and Union Jackass crown before the end of the show. So do stay with us all night. This is Dan Wilson tonight. Let's go. Just one thing first, though, I remain absolutely furious tonight that uh, West Ham player cat torturer Kurt Zuma uh, is proving to all pro footballers everywhere that even illegal behaviour won't see you properly reprimanded by your club. Now, you'll remember his disgraceful abuse of his poor Bengal kitty, who he kicked across his mansion. <laughs> Just outrageous. I mean, football fans, who in my view represent what's good about Britain, made their thoughts clear every time this scumbag touched the ball last night. And that's West Ham fans, by the way. But even as sponsors bail out on the club, manager David Moyes defended his decision to pick Zuma, who's, you know, it's all about results, isn't it? The club have taken all the actions that they, they can do at the moment and they're, they're you know, working on that behind the scenes. My job is to try and pick a team and pick the best team, which gives me the best chance at West Ham. And uh, Kurt was part of that team. Now, West Ham has fined him £250,000, which would bankrupt you or me, right? But for Zuma, it's nothing. That's two weeks' wages, so it's hardly a punishment. I'm sorry, I actually disagree uh, with Mr Moyes here, by his all, who, by all accounts, is a very decent human being. But sometimes morality has to come before winning trophies. At least the RSPCA have finally taken action. In a statement today, they said we'd like to reassure people that we're investigating and the cats are safe and in our care. We have been dealing with this since before the clip went viral online and we need to follow the proper legal process and not discuss due to UK GDPR laws. Now, this scumbag, Zuma, should never be allowed to own an animal again. I want to be treated with the full force of the law. You know I don't like to see people cancelled. So I'm not even calling on West Ham to sack him. But at the very least, there should have been some form of suspension for the club to show all of us that they took his actions seriously. Now, some good news in a moment. My reaction to the major COVID announcement today. But where is Mr Witty? Have you seen him? I want to know. Then my superstar panel weigh in. Let's have a first look at them. Tonight, it's the Daily Mail star columnist Amanda Platel, the publican and campaigner Adam Brooks, and the political and royal commentator Daisy McAndrew. But before a very packed show, it's the news with Polly Middlehurst. Dan, thank you. Your news at 10 o'clock. Police investigating lockdown parties in Downing Street are, as you've heard, to send out questionnaires to more than 50 people believed to have attended. It comes as Met officers are reviewing whether an online Christmas quiz at number 10 may have breached coronavirus restrictions after a new image emerged. It was published by the Daily Mirror newspaper and it shows the Prime Minister alongside three staff members and a bottle of sparkling wine in December 2020. At the time, there was a ban on indoor social mixing between households. In other news, the Prime Minister says he expects to end all coronavirus restrictions, including the need for people to self-isolate, a month early in England. Boris Johnson told MPs today he's going to present the government's Living with Covid plan after parliamentary recess later this month. Provided the current encouraging trends in the data continue, it is my expectation that we will be able to end the last domestic restrictions 
including the legal requirement to self-isolate if you test positive, a full month early. Boris Johnson speaking earlier. Well, the Prime Minister is due to fly to Poland tomorrow over the build-up of Russian forces near the Ukraine border. Boris Johnson is going to meet Poland's Prime Minister and President to reassure Eastern European allies about the UK's support. Earlier today, the Foreign Secretary landed in Moscow to meet with her Russian counterpart, Liz Truss, saying Russia must immediately withdraw its forces or face the consequences. A man serving life in prison for killing his fiancée has been found guilty of murdering his first wife six years earlier. 61-year-old Ian Stewart killed the children's author Helen Bailey at their home in Hertfordshire in 2016. After that conviction, police then investigated the 2010 death of Stewart's first wife, Diane Stewart, in Cambridgeshire. Detective Superintendent Jerome Kent, who led the investigation, says Stewart showed no remorse. He sat in mute silence during most of the interviews. Um, I believe that he felt he was uh, more intelligent and more superior to the officers that were investigating him. Jerome Kent. Now, as you've been hearing from Dan, the cats belonging to West Ham footballer Kurt Zuma are now in the care of the RSPCA. Zuma apologised yesterday after a video surfaced online of him kicking and slapping his cats. The RSPCA say they're investigating the incident and West Ham Football Club has fined their player, but perhaps more importantly, sportswear firm Adidas has ended its sponsorship deal with him. Now, scientists say they've made a huge step closer in making nuclear fusion energy a reality. Experts say recent experiments demonstrated the potential to deliver safe and sustainable low-carbon energy. Fusion energy is based on the same principle by which stars create heat and light. On TV, online and on your radio by DAB+. You're with GB News. Now back to Dan Wooten and tonight. It's been 36 long days since Professor Chris Whitty, unbelievably now a sir, has been seen in public or given any sort of press conference. England's chief medical officer, who had been predicting imminent doom throughout December, has gone missing. You probably remember Professor Whitty wanted us locked down again. He wanted Christmas cancelled. Omicron was all bad, he assured us. Forget the scientists and doctors from South Africa telling us the complete opposite. We should stay home and shut down our economy again. Full-fledged panic. Winter as a whole, I, I regret to say, is going to be exceptionally difficult for the NHS. We're only two to three doubling times away from a really quite serious pressure on the NHS. I mean, it's already serious, but one that actually would be very difficult to deal with. Uh, this is a really serious threat at the moment. The, how big a threat? There are several things we don't know but all the things that we do know are bad. Mr Whitty has been proven categorically wrong. But because he's gone missing, there's been no opportunity to ask him why he put us through all of this, why he relied on dodgy modelling, predicting thousands of deaths a day by now, and why he thought the health system was going to be overwhelmed. Whitty wasn't the only one, of course. Sage, independent sage, the Labour Party and even Cabinet Ministers Michael Gove and Sajid Javid all got Omicron spectacularly wrong. But thank God, thank God, inspired by Lord Frost and the brave Tory rebels, Boris Johnson stared them down. And today it allowed him this triumphant moment in the House of Commons where he revealed the end is in sight. All COVID restrictions in England will go this month. Provided the current encouraging trends in the data continue, it is my expectation that we will be able to end the last domestic restrictions, including the legal requirement to self-isolate if you test positive, a full month early. Yes, our national nightmare of freedom destroying and, in my view, largely unnecessary COVID regulations is nearly over. Of course, the BBC's headline on their 6pm news tonight asked, is this happening too soon? Will they ever stop and admit defeat? This mess 
must never be repeated. And that's why folk like Witty must front up. If we had lockdown, the cases would have dropped, as they have anyway, and Witty and co would have hailed lockdowns as the reason why. That's what they've done time and again. But as bombshell John Hopkins University research showed last week, lockdowns haven't actually worked. This research showed they reduced deaths just 0.2%, while causing a host of other problems, including inflation and an overwhelmed NHS for years to come. So while I will celebrate to some extent today that England is leading the world out of COVID hysteria and the fact that folk like me who rallied against these restrictions from March 2020 have been proven right, this is only just the beginning. Because if they can inflict this much state control over a virus with a low death rate, imagine what they can do in a more serious health crisis. And I will not forget and will continue to campaign against COVID tyranny around the world including right here in the UK, by the way, especially in Scotland and Wales, whose citizens sadly remained muzzled. But in England, at least, the individual's right to make sensible decisions about their own health with bodily autonomy is coming. So well done, Boris. But we must never lose those rights again. To respond now, my superstar panel, the Daily Mail columnist and broadcaster Amanda Platel, the publican and campaigner Adam Brooks, and the political and royal commentator, Daisy McAndrew. Adam Brooks, I know you've been campaigning on this for a long time as well, mm. so let me start with you tonight. Christopher Whitty has to front up, doesn't he, and mm. explain why he got this so terribly wrong, because businesses like yours, mm. which have already been put under intense pressure, would have had to shut yeah. under Mr Whitty's plan. And I mean, let's, let's not forget, plan B will, will also have cost businesses as well mm. and jobs. And the economy, Which we probably need. billions of pounds. Plan BS, as I've called it from the start. Right. We didn't need it. So we, we were that close. You know, and operators would have gone out of business. Uh, and January's been tough for many. So, you know, for my colleagues in the industry, um, I'd like answers. What, why did they get it so wrong when, you know, we had the South African scientists mm. telling us, you know, I was tweeting it, you was tweeting it. You know, anyone with, with common sense was, was looking around the world and seeing what was happening. Why are our experts so off on this? And, you know, if, if they know they're wrong, come and tell us why they was wrong. Mm. Tell us why, you know, was it modelling or did they know something else? But we, we deserve an answer because mm. there's been a lot of damage. Well, exactly. And Amanda Patel, that's why I think all of this is unravelling because, of course, COVID has become uh, far less severe as it's gone on. But it's all about whether these lockdowns actually ever worked that I think now has to be looked at. Lockdown, I have to say, well spotted for not spotting um, Professor Witty. And of course, Jonathan <laughs> Van Tam, who was, the, you know, the rock star of the lockdowns, he's, I was about to say a word starting with B, he's... <laughs> he's, run, gone. He's, he's gone. gone. <laughs> he's gone. <laughs> he's gone. He's out of there. he's now living in a university. He's working in a university. So all these guys who, who tormented us... Um, they're no longer accountable. And I think it's really shameful. I'm really surprised about Professor Whitty because I thought that he had a bit more integrity than that. I would like for him to come forward and say why he did this again, and I'd like to be able to say to him, if you ever try and lock us down again, it will take a cop van <laughs> and for me to be arrested, for me to ever but Amanda, abide isn't, by isn't, any of these isn't recommendations. Isn't there a little bit of you, because there is a little bit of me that feels quite sorry for them in the way that they were used by any... Everybody wanted, you know, to... We're going to you know, use the science. And actually what they meant at the beginning was we're going to hide behind the scientists because we're not sure what's going on. So we'll push them out in front and they can be our body armour. And I've always felt quite sorry for them because we all know, and particularly now that we're two years in, we know that science is not an exact science. And we know that just like any sort of statistic or data, you can interpret it however you want. And the scientists, scientists always knew that. Daisy. There were brave scientists. Technol there weren't a lot in, of them. Well, there was Technol in Sweden, and there were people here like Carl Hennigan and Sunitra Gupta. There were people in the US like Jay Bhattacharya. And the problem is they were shut out by people there, like Whiskey. There was certainly a bit of that, and there has certainly been data suppression. I completely mm. agree with that. And that all comes down to conversations we've all had before about nudge politics and about trying to you know, take the people with you and it, it, almost like a, a, a COVID project fear, just like we mm. had with Brexit. But there is also, you know, th those scientists that you're quoting, 
a lot of people disagree with them. Scientists disagree with each other. And this is the thing that I think we're still not coming to terms with, that you can't just hold up one scientist and say yeah. he was wrong and she was right or vice versa, because we're still learning about yeah. all of this. And I think but it's I really think dangerous to do that. to do that now, though, Adam, can't we? I mean, we have crunched this data now mm. for 18 months. Mm. And it's becoming increasingly clear that lockdowns did not have the impact that we were told that they had. I would like to focus more on the damage, the mental health. You know, I've been talking throughout about mental health. You know, being a public and I hear of tragic stories locally. Um, People I, who drink themselves to death. No, no. People that have got the That's me. depression and mental issues through being locked away, their businesses failing. I know. Um, it's been terrible. The fear, the fear that we've seen in the press. You know, and, and I think it's unforgivable. People are still terrified. Yeah. There are still yeah. people, Amanda, who genuinely are terrified to leave their homes. And I feel so sad for these people, but I don't blame them. I do blame the government scientists, and I do blame, to an extent, the government. Look, we were kind of in no man's land back then, weren't we? And we had to trust the people who were giving yeah. us expertise. Exactly, for the first I'm, few I'm weeks. I'm not forgiving about for, them. For the first few weeks, but as it went on. Mm -hmm. Look... I and just think, gone on for two years. do you know what I want to do at the moment, Dan? I want to kind of rejoice in the fact okay, let's that we are out of this hellhole. Yeah. I will never, ever break COVID rules again. <gasps> Did I say that? <laughs> I will never, ever. Is that not going to exist? <laughs> and, and, and look, Amanda, I think you are right. I mean, you can focus on the negative. There is a lot of positives here because if you look at the other countries around the world, and I'm talking about them a lot on the show, Canada, Australia... New Zealand, Scotland, Austria, the poor yep. folk in Scotland who we adore, and I can't believe you're having to go through this with that scheming sturgeon up there keeping you muzzled and keeping you in masks and keeping vaccine passports. So there is a lot to celebrate. Boris got a lot wrong, but he's got this call right, hasn't he? He's coming out of the blocks now and he's making the right calls. And for that, he should be celebrated mm. and, and applauded. And let's just hope that, you know, I do hope that Boris leads us into the next election um, as a Conservative. Look, we, we, we will never forget, though. We never forget oh, look, the I mistakes think, oh, and the Jesus, damage. We no. We've all got short memories. No, 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 no. There's, there's people that have lost people from mental health, businesses, jobs. I know. And they, they have to be accountable for the damage that they've done. Yeah, but how do you make people accountable? But, look, they were giving we their start... best advice. It's over. Right. There's nothing they We can have do. to move forward I'm now. I'm worried about old Prof Witty. Why? Well, because he was such a public. He was always a really. struck as a really decent but quite fragile man. Mm. Well, and I just is, think... Look, this is not personal. This is not personal. I'm sure Christopher Whitty is a good person, but unfortunately, as Adam mm. points out, these decisions had consequences. I know. Look, I've, I've got two words written down, Dan, and it's personal responsibility. Mm. And we've been talking about personal responsibility for yeah. over a yeah. year. And, and, and all I'm saying, Amanda, is that if it were the other way around and the government hadn't locked down and the NHS had have been overwhelmed, yeah. you know the BBC would have been demanding answers every single day yeah. from the government for that decision. And I think media organisations should be demanding of the scientists too, because they did get Omicron well, wrong. I, I think, to be fair, um, I, I completely agree with you about the BBC, but I would not like my newspaper, not that I own it, but I just work for it, um, the Daily Mail. We've been very critical of this. We've been no, really have. fierce. No, that, well, there's been... And don't get me wrong, um, there's been shining lights in the, newspa in the newspaper industry. No, Daily only the Mail, Daily Mail. Daily Telecast. No, only the Daily Mail, too. sorry. Mail Online, of course, <laughs> where online. I happen yes. to work, has been very <laughs> anti-lockdown throughout. So Amanda Patel, Adam Brooks, Daisy McAndrew. It's a good day today. We'll celebrate throughout the night. The Queen's blessing has helped future Queen consort Camilla further bolster her newfound popularity, but will the public ever admire her as much as Princess Diana? Coming up, Royal biographer Robert Jobson joins me from Dubai, where he's awaiting Prince William's inaugural visit to the UAE. He'll give his expert view. But first, as Health Minister Gillian Keegan apologises for attending a meeting despite having COVID. <gasps> Shock horror! Would you be happy to let the infected mix freely in society? Will social media sensation Zuby and broadcaster Bev Turner both think it's time we let people get on with their lives? The top medic, Dr David Strain, has branded the PM an idiot for planning to scrap enforced isolation. They go head to head in the clash next. I want to know what you think about this too. My email address, dan at gbnews.uk. Tweet me at gbnews and there's a poll running there too. We'll have the results in just a moment. Hello, I'm Alex Deakin. Welcome to your latest update from the Met Office. Some wintry weather across Scotland, strong winds and some snow flurries as well. 
and across Northern Ireland it could turn quite icy tonight. There's a cold front across the south of England. That's bringing a bit of rain and drizzle here and there, but it's further north where we've got the cold air already and the combination of these weather fronts and this area of low pressure that could bring some pretty nasty conditions to parts of Scotland. We do have Met Office yellow warnings in place, snow and strong winds combining to make blizzards. So some pretty grim traveling conditions across Scotland, travel disruption possible, and ice is a big hazard across Northern Ireland where the showers will continue here. Elsewhere, apart from a bit of drizzle on the south coast, most of England and Wales will be dry, not quite as mild as recent nights, but still for most above freezing. But the wintry weather will still be there in the morning across Scotland and Northern Ireland. Ice for Northern Ireland, the combination of strong winds and snow across parts of Scotland, particularly the higher routes, some travel disruption likely. But even through the central belt, it will get very windy and the winds themselves could cause some disruption. But certainly the combination of snow and strong winds making for some pretty grim travelling conditions during Thursday. A few showers will affect northern England where it will also be blustery, much of the south dry and bright. Temperatures around average, feeling colder in the south compared to recent days and certainly feeling colder with the winds across Scotland and northeast England, which will slowly ease during the course of the night and then with clear skies and lighter winds, it's going to turn frosty for pretty much all of us as we head into Friday. Still some wintry showers in the far north, so it could be icy here on Friday morning, but for many places, Friday's a, a day of sparkling winter sunshine. It'll cloud over a little from the west. There may just be one or two scattered showers, but for most, Friday looks dry and fine. Temperatures close to average, but the winds won't be as strong on Friday, but certainly it'll be a cold and frosty start. The weather warnings are all on the Met Office website if you want more details. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Time now for The Clash. And hours before the PM announced that the self-isolation law would be scrapped this month, the health minister apologised for continuing a meeting despite shock horror having COVID. Gillian Keegan found out she had tested positive during a meeting yesterday but pressed ahead anyway before isolating afterwards. Keegan announced late last night, when I was told my test was positive, I was listening to three fathers who had tragically lost their daughters to suicide. I told them the result and took further precautions, but with their consent, I stayed for a short period to hear their stories. I should have immediately ended the meeting, and on reflection, this was an error of judgment on my part. I fully recognise the importance of following the letter and spirit of the policy, so I want to be upfront about what happened and apologise for the mistake I made. Now, Keegan isn't going to lose her job, but it got us asking the question whether infected people should be able to make their own choice about mixing in public 
as we enter the potential bliss of a post-pandemic world. So, what do you think? Are you happy to let the positive mix freely in society? Dan at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. We've got our poll running there too. But first, let me bring in the rapper and star podcaster, Zuby, the broadcaster, Bev Turner, and the University of Exeter Medical School lecturer, Dr. David Strain, to debate this. So, Zuby, let me kick off with you. I think this is about respect. And of course, if you are particularly sick and with any type of illness and you're symptomatic, the sensible thing is to stay home for a couple of days. But should there be a legal requirement for you to do that? I say absolutely not. Where do you stand? Dan, you've taken the words completely out of my mouth. I agree with you 100% when it comes to uh, what happened here with Gillian Keegan. I don't think she made any, I don't think she did anything wrong at all. I think it's very telling that she informed the people immediately who she was meeting with that she was COVID positive and they themselves were happy to continue yeah. with the meeting with some additional distancing and precautions. So that's fine. I'm sure if they'd said, oh, we're worried, we're not comfortable, she would have been happy to end it immediately. But given the circumstances, I don't think she did anything wrong. And I agree with you, just like with a cold, a flu, anything else, if you are sick, the sensible and correct and respectful thing to do is to avoid meeting with other people. If they're comfortable with it and they're friends, family, et cetera, then that's a different story. But I don't think that we need the hard arm of the law and the state involvement in this. Because, Bev Turner, that's been one of the really difficult things for me across the course of this pandemic. We're saying we don't trust folk to make sensible decisions. And the only way society works is if we do trust folk to make sensible decisions. We have to kind of think what life used to be like before the last <laughs> two years. And what I've noticed recently, which I find really odd, is that um, people are going about with coughs and colds and things and going, well, it's OK, I can, I can come to your event because it isn't COVID. You know, <laughs> previously, we, we would have all been quite courteous and go, do you know what? I've got a cough. I'm not going to come to your event. I don't want to infect anybody. And yet now it's like because nothing but COVID matters, we are actually behaving in a way that's so different to how we were behaving two years ago. And I think we do have to be, we do have to be understanding, we do have to be sympathetic to people who will be terrified by the idea of the infected walking amongst us because they have been so dehumanized, they've been demonized as though we have some sort of monster in our midst. So it's gonna take a huge amount of de-radicalization for some people to be happy with this notion, but it's what we need to do, Dan. We need to do this to get back to some sort of semblance of real life. We can't be locking teenagers away. We can't be keeping teenagers off school, we, uh, teachers off school. We can't be keeping doctors off work because they've got the omni cold. It's crazy and it is time to move on. Dr. Strain, you, agree, you disagree with Bev strongly, don't you? Well, we're in a position that we actually don't know what the real figures are. Um, the government's reported 68,000 on the same day that the Zoe app has recorded 203,000 cases um, yesterday. And we are in a position that since we are dependent on the population to report COVID, which still is the mandate, that the discrepancy between the independents and the official government figures have turned into this threefold discrepancy. Until we get to the bottom of what this discrepancy is and where it is, then we are in a position that if we get rid of the need for people to be testing and then isolating, we are effectively sending our elderly, our vulnerable, those who are being treated for conditions like cancer, um, like bloodborne diseases, and therefore the vaccine's not as potent for them, we are putting them back into isolation. And until we get to the bottom of this, then we are actually condemning a, a group, a significant population to this risk. Dr. Strain, can I just pick you up on that? Can, can I just pick you up on that, Dr. Strain? Because the infection fatality rate, uh, now that Omicron has become the main variant in this country, is comparable to flu, the latest statistics show. We never used to have these same considerations during a winter flu season where we would seriously talk about restricting the rest of the population because of a small group of poor folk who are extremely ill. So what's different now? 
So we are talking very much about the BA1 Omicron variant. We're now on to four different variations of Omicron. And although the trajectory from Delta to Omicron has been very much that the disease is uh, appearing to be less severe, we have absolutely no idea what the next variant will hold. Remember that when we went from the wild type to the alpha variant, and then from the alpha to de Delta variant, there was a step increase in mortality with each of those. Um, we now have the first variant that shows a drop down. And I am all in favor of getting this. We all want to get back to normal. I don't want to be opening more COVID wards like I've been doing today. I don't want to be in a position where I'm canceling operations for these people to be cared for in, operation, uh, in hospital, where we're canceling vital uh, procedures that will improve other people's quality of life because the wards are being overwhelmed with COVID. And whatever the national figures show, I can absolutely guarantee you that I've been coming out of meetings today trying to figure out how we are going to try and keep some general semblance of normal activity in the hospital going, whilst at the same time caring for this huge number of patients that have started coming in since the list lifting of the plan b restrictions now don't get me wrong i do want to get rid of this i do want to get rid of these different elements but until we have clarities of which is the right figure is it the zoe app figure or the ons figure which says 20 uh, one in 20 people have got covid in the last week or is it the government figures which would actually have the estimate of about one in um, 120 having covid which of these organizations have got it right and once we figure out which one is right then make the appropriate decision if it's the one in 120 that the government dashboard would be showing then actually yeah it probably is the but right Subi, time Subi, but if it's the one in case numbers are relevant now what matters is the death rate and we know that that has plummeted and i actually view high case numbers zuby as a pretty positive thing because it's this Great natural immunity, and the more folk that get Omicron, I mean, I've had it complete pussycat. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think um, Omicron. I, yeah, so in terms of the in terms of the the details of the virus and its evolution, it seems clear to me, just as we know with the flu, for example, that this is going to continue to mutate and change, and that's going to go forever. So. By the logic that I'm hearing, this could just go on for. Ever. I mean, there's always going to be some type of justification. There's always going to be unknowns and discrepancies. And if people are not dying at extraordinary rates or being hospitalized at extraordinary rates, then not, I mean, I'll be honest, none of these uh, re restrictions made sense to me to begin with. And I think it comes back up a level to a more philosophical question, which is, do we trust members of our society to generally behave in a correct and respectful way, or do we not? Do we think that we need to use the force of the state to enforce this? Because every time you're advocating a policy, and people always forget this, you are advocating for the usage of agents of the state. You're advocating for the use of police to potentially come and apprehend people and find them or imprison them if they are in any of these laws. And I don't think that is necessary. It's never been necessary during the cold and the flu season, despite the fact that the flu, the flu kills a lot of people. I think people have forgotten this. People think that the flu is a yeah. very mild virus that doesn't cause any damage. That's never been the case. It's just that we're used to it. Right. We are used to it. So when okay. you hear the term flu, it sounds it sounds very familiar, whereas with covid and Delta and Omicron, all of this, it sounds very new and novel. And I think that scares people more. So I'm very much in the position that we need to be able to trust the British people. We need to be able to trust our friends, neighbors, relatives, and people need to just have common sense and say, look, I, if I'm mm -hmm. sick, I'm not feeling good. Um, I know that when I had covid myself, I wouldn't even have been able to go out and socialize if I if I'd wanted to. Um, and also, I have common sense. I don't want to go out there and, and infect anybody else. And I don't need the government to try to force me to, to do that. Mm. No, indeed. And, and Bev, look, I have a lot of respect for Dr. Strain as a medic, but isn't one of the issues that the medical profession now think it's almost normal uh, for the mechanisms of state to be used to protect public health. And that isn't normal. It shouldn't be normal in a free society. And we have to be very clear about that. Absolutely. One of the big issues we've had from day one, Dan, and you and I have both been asked calling for this publicly whenever we could, 
What is the metric which indicates we are out of this? And we have never had that from the government. And never. even when no. we have... Even now? Never. We never have. And so when I, I like, like you, when I hear Dr. Strain talk about these case numbers, it, it's just kind of, you know, it's white noise because what does that mean? These numbers in themselves in a vacuum are utterly meaningless and they are hopefully giving great immunity, great natural immunity around the country. If Boris Johnson had said, when we have X number of deaths per day, you're all free. Or even when we have X number of cases per day, you're all free. They wouldn't even ballpark it. They haven't ballparked it from day one, which is why we're having this conversation now, because there was never a finish line. They, they kept moving the goalposts. If you remember, they moved the goalposts on an almost monthly basis. It was a, a type of psychological torture for, for most of us. And we're still Amazing. there now. Okay. And so, yeah. And, and so we, we've got this line now in, in a couple of weeks' time. Great. But he's still leaving us hanging saying if the data continues in the way that it appears to, then we will be uh, free of domestic restrictions. Well, I still think there's a chink in, the, in the, his armor. Like there is a lift, the door is ajar. He doesn't necessarily have to free us in, in a week. I think that will be a, a two weeks, that will be a political decision. I think this is largely a political decision because it isn't based on numbers. We still haven't been given it. It isn't based necessarily on the science. And Dr. Strain and, and the three of us would probably agree on that in principle, that it would have been nice to have a clear met metric. We may not agree on what the outcome should be now. Well, indeed. But I think we'd all like to know what, what looks like the finish. And David Strain, just finally to you, I would argue now that you have 98% of English adults with COVID antibodies, whether that's via natural infection uh, whether it's by vaccination, if that's not the finish line, if we're not at the finish line now, this thing never ends. Um, I, I would actually absolutely agree with what's just been said. We've all been calling for that finish line all the way through. Um, personally, I'd say it is the point where waiting lists are coming down rather than going up, because that's the metric we're judging it by. People are not getting their operations at the moment that will be improving their quality of life and their longevity within the UK because their beds are being filled with people with COVID. My metric would be as soon as those waiting lists are coming down, as soon as it's back to expecting a three month to get so it's the waiting list now. Bev, that's a new one, Bev. It's the waiting lists now. It's the waiting <laughs> lists. OK. <laughs> I, I, I just don't buy it. There's a tiny percentage no. of beds which are being taken up by, by yeah. people who are there purely because of yeah. COVID. And the hospitalisations are coming way down. But look, what a respectful discussion. Thank you so much to all three of you. That was the rapper and podcaster Zuby, the broadcaster Bev Turner and the University of Exeter Medical School lecturer Dr David Strain. Thank you to you all. So who did you agree with? Ben on Twitter says, if you're coughing, spluttering and actually ill then for your sake and everyone else's stay at home. But we need to stop testing healthy people or else this is never going to stop. Completely agree, by the way. Stop testing the, the healthy. I've always said that. Penelope on Twitter says, although I agree with lifting restrictions, I think anyone with COVID should avoid others for five days. There are many vulnerable people out there who cannot have the vaccine. And Martin on email says, we mix with people who may have the flu and this is no worse. We must live with this virus and with other illnesses, absolutely. And I think the really great thing, by the way, about those actual flow tests is that it actually tells you when you are infectious. So let's drop this arbitrary five-day thing. When I had Omicron, I was literally infectious, according to the lateral flow tests, for two days. You know that little line? Only two days. For other people, it's 10 or 11 days. So again, that's why we shouldn't have these rules, we should be able to make sensible decisions for ourselves. And your verdict's now in. You're a very sensible bunch. 81% of you are happy to let COVID positive people mix freely in society, while 19% of you say COVID should not be able to roam free. Now, coming up, should Northern workers really have to accept lower wages than Londoners simply because London is London? That's the somewhat outrageous view of one of the Chancellor Rishi Sunak's top eight. But TV News' is very own Geordie Darren Grimes. Oh, he's going to have some choice words for the Treasury's defeatist attitude in the outsider at 9.45. But first, the Queen's blessing has helped future Queen consort Camilla's popularity soar. But can the public ever admire her as much as the late great Princess Diana? Royal biographer Robert Jobson joins me live from Dubai. He's awaiting Prince William's arrival there and he'll give his verdict on Camilla next.
GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners, the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Darren Grimes in a moment, but time now for Crown Jewels with Robert Jobson. And Jobber actually joins me from Dubai tonight, ahead of Prince William's first official visit to the UAE, where he'll bang the drum for Britain at Expo 2020. And it's been a dramatic week for the heir to the throne, as he's had to accept that Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, the woman his mother, Princess Diana, once hated, will be made Queen Consort once Charles becomes king. Uh, you know, I'm uneasy about this. I've been honest about that all week. But following the Queen's endorsement in her Platinum Jubilee message at uh, the weekend, a JL Partners survey conducted yesterday found that 55% of Brits now back the move. These results published in the Daily Mail today represent a stark turnaround in popularity for Camilla after a YouGov poll from November showed that only 14% had initially wanted her to be Queen Consort. However, more respondents, 58%, still believe Diana would have made a superior queen to Camilla, suggesting the spectre of the People's Princess will continue to loom large when Charles takes the throne. And Jovo, look, I, I know you're very much on Team Camilla with this one. And when I was speaking about this on Monday's show, I made the point that it was probably around a third of Brits who were with me and still feel uncomfortable about the idea of Queen Camilla because of the memory of Diana. And, and this poll actually did represent that. I think it was something about 28% of, of Brits still actually opposed to Camilla as Queen Consort. You think we all need to get a life and move on, right? No, I think you're probably right. And I think actually it might even be more. Um, um, and that more people are probably not really either concerned either way. It's difficult to say who would make the better Queen Consort. Clearly, the, the Queen Consort has to be the best partner for Prince Charles. And that's what all I'm saying. I think if you start messing around with the titles and saying that Camilla should be, you know, um, the princess consul, which was a great fudge that Clarence House was putting around, I think you demean, you diminish the, the, the monarchy and you would diminish Prince Charles's reign. I mean, at the end of the day, he will be the king and the wife of a king is a queen. And you know, you wouldn't have a president with the third lady or the fourth lady. I mean, she would, she has to be the queen. And and I think that when he's out meeting other heads of state or in places like the UAE or other, you know, in the Middle East where the, these things matter more, it would just look wrong. And I, I think it's better for the, that situation. You know, we're not going to deal with the longest reign here, um, Dan. I mean, the bigger issue for me, though, is that what happens if the pre Prince of Wales becomes king, but he predeceases Camilla? You know, are we going to have William, who, who said he wants to give Diana back her title, HRH, when he becomes king, 
are we going to have Camilla on the balcony without King Charles, you know, and, and Prince William? You know, what would her title be? You know, the, the Queen's stepmother or the King's stepmother. It doesn't, it, mm. it, they haven't really thought that bit of it through, I don't think. <laughs> it's problematic, isn't it? And of course, Joe, still no word uh, from Prince Harry at all, which we know is purposeful mm. because they think a lot about their communications and how they're going to be read into. So, do we get the idea that William has accepted this and Prince Harry hasn't? Well, I think that's what they're trying to say. I think we shouldn't read too much. I mean, Prince William is more pragmatic, there's no doubt about that, because he's going to be the king. He has to be, really, doesn't he? He has to be a bit more grown up about all this. But one must remember that when Harry's mum died, she, he was only a little boy, he was only 12. And, you know, he would have found it quite emotionally difficult, to say the very least, to accept as his stepmom. And to be fair to Camilla, she never really had a, she had a family herself, children herself. She never really forced herself to be um, a standing mother. She ne she never did. And but I, you, know, you don't get the impression that Harry is particularly fond of Camilla. And we're waiting to see what he says in this book um, that is be will be coming out. And I'm sure it's not going to be good. I'm sure it's not. I'm sure it's going to be negative about Camilla. So that's not going to lead to great relations between. Him and his par, I shouldn't think. Jobbo, just a quick word. You're in Dubai awaiting the arrival of Prince William. Uh, why is he there? It's a first visit, I believe. Well, that's right. I mean, this is Expo here. Of course, it's Expo 2020, even though we're in 2022 because of all the delays. But he's here back I in was the wondering time. about that. OK, so it's two years delay. Yeah. OK, that makes sense. No, no, it's two years because <laughs> of the pandemic, as we say. But... Um, yeah, he's here. He's on a solo visit, no Catherine. He'll be in Abu Dhabi too, where he's going to be dealing with uh, issues to do with the di diplomacy there. But mainly it's about banging the drum for Britain and to do with his Earthshot prize. OK, good stuff. Well, look, keep us posted if anything major goes down. That's Robert Jobson. Absolutely. Live from Dubai. What time is it there, Jobbo? It, it's a crazy hour. It's about two in the morning, I think. Sometimes. I was, I was going to say, it's late. OK, get to sleep. Don't go to the hotel bar. I know what you're like. You've got William coming. You've got a See PDA. You Thank, you. Thank you, Jalvo. Now, coming up, despite their faux outrage over the PM's Savile comments and the Starmer hate mob, are Labour the ones really responsible for putting poison into politics? Well, that's the verdict of Andrew Pearce, the Daily Mail columnist, and we'll debate that and give you a very first look at tomorrow's newspaper front pages in the media buzz from 10. But next, as Chancellor Rishi Sunak's top aide offensively claims northern workers should accept lower wages than lavish Londoners, why should where you live impact your salary. Well, Darren Grant, he's disgusted by this level enough at uh, defeatism. He's going to stand up for the Northern powerhouse and the outsiders straight after the break. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News.
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Darren Grimes is tonight's outsider. Now, an advisor to the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, has caused fury by saying Northerners should accept lower wages because, quote, London is London. Tim Loinig wrote in a paper for uh, the think tank Policy Exchange that the only way towns and cities that are less well connected can compete to attract firms is to accept lower wages, and in that we need to accept above all, that we cannot guarantee to regenerate every town and every city in Britain that has fallen behind, and that we cannot, with the best will in the world, move J.P. Morgan to Blackburn or Deutsche Bank to Sunderland. A friendly word of advice uh, to Mr. Loinig. Don't go to Blackburn or Sunderland anytime soon, not least because you might run into our very own Darren Grimes. Darren's angry, and he's got a powerful answer to self-absorbed Londoners. Darren, go on. I know you're not happy about this. I'm not. I'm not. I, I find it absolutely extraordinary, actually, given that, you know, we've got the likes of Nissan up here. As far as the, the electric car revolution that's going to come to Britain, the Northeast is actually doing quite well, thank you very much, right? I just find it incredible that an advisor to a chancellor who has to be, Dan, I mean, you've mentioned it on the show many times, one of the most prominent advocates of the whole levelling up agenda, right? He is leading the charge in that respect. And that's all about what is levelling up. Well, that's all about the, the sort of evening of the, the playing field between the regions and breaking down economic patterns and, and places like London, for example, where, Dan, frankly, you're, you see people leave universities up here in the northeast and think, well, I've got to go to London, right? That's where the jobs are. That's the only place I can go after university. And what we're saying is actually, in order to ensure that the, we can attract the sort of jobs and, and businesses to the regions, is through devolution, right? Is through actually saying to areas, you can get an Andy Burnham, you can get a Ben Houchen, you can get an Andy Street, that actually says, we're gonna make ourselves more competitive, whether that be through taxation and all the rest of it, and actually give us a fighting chance to, to attract this foreign direct investment and all the rest of it. Because right now, the makeup of London being this, the economy being so with a laser-like focus, yeah. determined to do everything in London, centralized to the extreme in London, I actually say we should ignore the government advisor who is quite simply telling us little northerners right that we should keep stum and we must learn to know our place and not aspire to have the levels of investment and wages to actually rival london ultimately people in sw1 dan who who sneer at the likes of the north forget that the north kickstarted the industrial revolution for example right they forget that it was our the black gold that kickstarted the whole industrial revolution that powered an empire. I think he's totally wrong, utterly wrong, to believe that Northerners should just accept smaller wages. Why can't we? Serious question. Why can't we aspire to see the huge investment levels that were once in London now actually come to other parts, other regions of the UK? Isn't that part of being one shared family, four, reg four part constituent parts of the UK? actually benefiting from what Team GB can actually do around the world. I genuinely think devolution and levelling up can actually bring about a more level playing field and make it better for people up and down the country who for far too long, Dan, have said, well, I don't know about you, but it looks like there's an awful lot going on in London and not enough going on up here. Well, I know I can't imagine what Michael Gove uh who's obviously behind the whole levelling up project now, would think about what Mr. Loynig said, because he actually, Darren, and, and you're going to hate this even, even more, you know, he actually said, 
that he wants to allow London to grow. And he says if that happens, some of the people living in those areas are able to migrate to London. So, I mean, this goes completely against what Gove has been saying anyway. Absolutely. And look, I, I don't I'm not against London. Right. I think London is, is a great place. It has many qualities. I think well, it's you moved a, a real here, shame. You didn't like it and you're back in County Durham. I'm back. I'm back up here. Yeah. But I do think Sadiq Khan is ruining it, frankly, Dan. So the the at this rate, I think the other regions will be doing fantastically well out of Sadiq Khan's management of London, because let's be honest, it's not safe to walk the streets in London at no. the moment, is it? Well, it's so Sadiq Khan's I'm, lawless London. You don't want to be exactly. here under Sadiq Khan, let me tell you. So therefore, I think actually, as far as devolution is concerned, this advisor is calling it all wrong because I do actually think there's a golden opportunity, as I say, in areas like car manufacturing, in areas like battery manufacturing, for the regions to actually do very well out of competition, out of greater competition within the UK. And I don't just mean given... Uh, you know, Nicky Sturgeon more powers or Mark Drakeford. I mean, can you imagine that, Dan? Hasn't that man been a menace? Please don't suggest it. Exactly. They need less. But we actually <laughs> they need less. less. But we actually give power to to parts of these places, to mayors and all the rest of it, instead of just handing taking power from London to hand it to Holyrood and the Welsh Assembly. I'm actually talking about empowering communities. That's what the leveling up agenda looks yeah. like to me. OK, Darren Grimes, a uh, very strong argument there for the North. And I believe on your show, Real Britain, 2 p.m. On, on Saturdays and Sundays, you've been doing some filming in County Durham this week, have you? We have, yes. We've been speaking to proud and patriotic people up here in the northeast of England, Dan. And let me tell you, had I asked them, were they to believe that we couldn't compete with London? I think they'd tell this advisor a sling his hook, to be frank. So, you know, <laughs> let's let's see what Rishi Sunak makes of it all, Dan. Well, Darren, I'm loving the show. So uh, we'll be tuned in 2 p.m. Saturday. That's Darren Grimes, tonight's Outsider. Thank you. It's coming up to 10 p.m. This is Dan Wooten tonight. And there's freedom convoys pop up all over the globe with the announcement tonight that the European contingent is planning to blockade Brussels on Valentine's Day. Other world's truckers about to become our unlikely saviors from COVID authoritarianism. Well, the original Canadian convoy spokesman and organizer Benjamin Dichter joins me for an exclusive interview about the honking heard all around the world. That's coming up at 10.20. I cannot wait. As the government calls for comedian Jimmy Carr to be cancelled for his Holocaust joke, are we in danger of becoming a censorship state, a bit like China? Well, Silky Carlo of Big Brother Watch is fighting back against a bill that could make uh, close to the bone gags as well as dissenting views on COVID illegal. She's uncancelled at 10.40. Despite their outrage over the Savilgate controversy, a Labour, in fact, responsible for putting poison into politics? My superstar panel will weigh up whether the opposition are the real nasty party next. And tonight I'm joined by Daily Mail star columnist Amanda Patel, social media activist Adam Brooks and political commentator Daisy McAndrew. And after Adele uh, was labelled unbelievably a turf uh, for saying this while picking up the first ever gender neutral award at the Brits. I really love being a woman and being a female artist, I do. That makes you a turf, apparently, these days, in this horrible woke world. Should all award shows refrain from going woke and keep men and women separate? That story, plus a first look at tomorrow's newspapers in the media buzz at 10.30. And as ever, we'll crown a brand new Greatest Britain and Union Jackass this Wednesday. You've got to fancy the chances of a certain cack kitting scumbag, I would say. But before all of that, the latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst.
Dan, thank you. Tonight's top stories. Police investigating lockdown parties in Downing Street are to send out questionnaires to more than 50 people believed to have attended. It comes as Met officers are reviewing whether a Christmas quiz at number 10 may have breached coronavirus restrictions after a new image emerged in the newspapers. Published by the Daily Mirror, the picture shows the Prime Minister alongside three staff members and a bottle of sparkling wine. It all happened in December 2020, and that was at a time when there was a ban on indoor social mixing between households. In other news, the Prime Minister says he expects to end all coronavirus restrictions, including the need for people to self-isolate a month early in England. Boris Johnson told MPs today he'll present the government's Living with Covid plan after parliamentary recess later this month. Provided the current encouraging trends in the data continue, it is my expectation that we will be able to end the last domestic restrictions, including the legal requirement to self-isolate if you test positive, a full month early. Boris Johnson. Well, the Prime Minister is due to fly to Poland tomorrow over the build-up of Russian forces near the Ukraine border. Boris Johnson will meet Poland's Prime Minister and President to reassure them about the UK's support for Eastern European allies. And earlier today, the Foreign Secretary landed in Moscow to meet with her Russian counterpart, Liz Truss, saying Russia must immediately withdraw forces or face the consequences. Here, a man serving life in prison for killing his fiancée has been found guilty of murdering his first wife six years earlier. 61-year-old Ian Stewart killed children's author Helen Bailey at their home in Hertfordshire in 2016. And after that conviction, police started investigating the 2010 death of Stewart's first wife, Diane, in Cambridgeshire. Detective Superintendent Jerome Kent, who led the investigation, said Stewart showed no remorse. He sat in mute silence during most of the interviews. Um, I believe that he felt he was uh, more intelligent and more superior to the officers that were investigating him. Jerome Kent. Now, the cats belonging to West Ham footballer Kurt Zuma are now in the care of the RSPCA. Zuma apologised yesterday after a video surfaced online of him kicking and slapping his cats. The RSPCA say they're investigating the incident. And meanwhile, the football club West Ham has fined their player and the sportswear firm Adidas has ended its sponsorship deal with him. A powerful drug combination for breast cancer could save thousands of lives. That's according to results from a new study. The research found if a drug called Keytruda is given in combination with chemotherapy, it can reduce the chance of the disease coming back. Experts say it could save as many as 10,000 lives every year. On TV, online and on your radio via DAB+, you're with GB News. Now back to Dan Wooten and tonight. Tomorrow's news tonight now in our media buzz. First look at the front pages, and actually they've both taken a very different take on uh, Boris Johnson's big announcement. The Metro are excited. They call it Fab Feb 21st. This is the date uh, that the current COVID restrictions could be lifted in England after Boris today announced his plan for living with the virus. The requirement to self-isolate after a positive test result is among the restrictions getting the boot. And the PM called this next phase an important step for the country as we exit the pandemic. Also on the front page there, Rue Stunnett. Colleen Rooney put a Wagatha Christie row with fellow footballer's wife Rebecca Vardy behind her this evening as she stepped out for the world premieres of Amazon's uh, documentary about her partner, Wayne. I actually really want to see that because they open up about all of his naughty, naughty, naughty behaviour. I love Rebecca Vardy, though. I have to say, I'm Team Vardy. There you go. The Independent report that scientists have issued a warning on the early end to COVID rules. Oh, bore off. Bore off. They're so predictable, aren't they? Listen to this. One scientific advisor told the paper that he was concerned by the very high number of cases. Other experts have been quoted as saying that the decision is either very stupid or very brave. Let me tell you, it's very brave. Not at all stupid. The stupid thing would be continue to keep this country in a straitjacket. 
My superstar panel are back with me now, the Daily Mail star columnist Amanda Patel, the publican and campaigner Adam Brooks, and the royal commentator Daisy McAndrew. Now, following the mobbing of Labour leader Keir Starmer in Westminster earlier this week, the hysterical crusade to pin the blame on the Prime Minister continues at pace. You'll remember Boris has been accused of inciting the hecklers, and that's what they are, by the way, hecklers. There was no violence, there was no physical violence, they just used their words to protest, which I think you're allowed. But they heckled him about the comment uh, that the Labour leader, who was formerly Director of Public Prosecutions, failed to take down the BBC star paedophile and serial sex abuser Jimmy Savile. While well, writing in today's Daily Mail, Andrew Pearce claims that it's actually the Labour Party pouring poison into politics. And I agree with him, because there are just so many real-world examples. So let's cast our mind back. Just two years ago, Senior Labour MP Chris Bryant, he is a nasty piece of work. And he was forced to make an apology after claims he mined F off. And he didn't say F, let me tell you, at Speaker Sir Lindsay Hoyle in the Commons Chamber. Then, remember when Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy likened Brexiteers to Nazis? I'm just looking over there at Winston Churchill on the 30th of September 1938. He stood up in Parliament and he said we would not appease Hitler. I'm looking across to Nelson Mandela, who would not give in to apartheid. We say we will not give in to the ERG. By implication, you're comparing the ERG to the Nazi party, or, or at least to the South African racists. Now, whatever you think about the ERG, that was an unacceptable comparison, wasn't it? Andrew, I would say that that wasn't strong enough. Oh, and of course, who can forget Deputy Leader Angela Rayner's scumgate. Such a nice woman, isn't she? Here she was, letting loose at the party's conference just last year. We cannot get any worse than a bunch of scum, homophobic, racist, misogynistic, yeah. absolute, yeah. I, I, but I can go on, though. Do you remember the ex-Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell uh, calling Tory MP Esther McVeigh, wait for it, uh, a stain on humanity? And let me tell you, she's one of my colleagues, she's certainly far from that, and quoted an activist who called for her to be lynched. He has, to this day, stood by those insults. I simply reported what was shouted out at the public yeah, meeting. Didn't, that, that stain on humanity thing wasn't reported. Well, that I was, was you in the House of Commons, wasn't that it? That was, that was. And I was angry. Sometimes it is better to be honest with people about how you feel. <laughs> and that is before I even get to the despicable anti-Semitism wrought by their former leader, Jeremy Corbyn, who, remember, Keir Starmer wanted to be Prime Minister. Amanda Platel, Andrew Pearce is right, isn't he? It's not the Tories that are the nasty party, it's Labour. Dan, I'm afraid that um, Andrew Pearce is right. <laughs> um, and, and I... Look, I've worked within politics for a long time, just as Daisy has. Um, I love the Lib Dems. You know, I was crazy <laughs> about Charles Kennedy. I would have married him if he'd had me. Um, <laughs> but He wasn't that crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're in such trouble, you want to Dan. Take that back? I take you are that back. in such trouble. I withdraw and apologise, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Okay, I'll give you a perfect example of um, the, the Labour Party is very tribal, and they hate Tories with a passion. Mm. Um, um, Angela is right, and they think we're all scum. They think we're homophobic. They think we're racist. Um, and I can uh, an example of what they're like. I went to an event. I'm a friend of um, Brenda Coles, and it was a memorial service for his um, wife Jo, and I'd been invited to this. Godforsaken hole out in the middle of Wales, driven there, gone all the way down all this mud. And then when I got down there, as a very senior female front bencher came up to me and said, What the F in hell are you doing here? Get out. And I said, She said, What are you doing here? I said, Oh, well, actually, I've just traipsed across the countryside so I can write a really vicious piece about a wonderful woman who was murdered by a, um, by a hideous right wing. Um, and, and she said, oh, were you invited? It would never have occurred mm. to her that I would be a friend of the Cox family. Mm. It would never occur to her that, you know, that there's this kind of this tribalism which is so vicious. And, and that, you know, those quotes from Angela Rayner, 
you know, it goes on, you know, I'm not a homophobe, mm. you know, Andrew Pearce is my best mate, you know, I'm, I'm not a racist, I'm not, you know, I, 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 it is just appalling. And it goes on and on and on. They weaponise it, don't they? The, they... the Labour Party weaponise hatred, even though they do it themselves. But do they really think that half the people in this country, like the people who voted for Brexit, do they really think that we are these ghastly people that basically should be exterminated? No, but it sounds good on well, TV. Daisy, I, I mean, I get called all sorts of things. Uh, do you, Dan? What's by, the worst by... thing you've ever been called? <laughs> oh, go Come on, there. give us one. I'm going to go there. But I'm no member of any political party. I'm completely independent. I've never been a member of a political party in this country. Uh, but I will still be described as Tory scum. I mean, look, you've been there as a journalist. You've also been there as a political advisor. Why, why are the left in this country so nasty and pour poison into everything? I mean, I would, I, I would say that we've got to be very careful saying the left is so nasty. There are elements of the left that feel a moral superiority. Yeah. And in fairness, and by the way, Andrew feel that it's... wasn't talking about the, the Lib Dems. He was talking yeah. about Labour. And, and those people who have that sense of moral superiority think it's therefore acceptable to besmirch a whole, a whole political party. And, and if we look back to, to Brexit, it was exactly the same. Yeah. Now, I, I had friends on the Remain side who decided they could never speak to their friends who had voted Brexit yeah. just ever insane. again. Madness. But I had no friends on the Brexit side who decided they could never speak to their but Remainer was, friends that again. Was and it's, it's, that was it's a similar constantly. thing. I, I, on Facebook, every day, I would see a Ramona, because you were a prominent Brexiteer. And oh, I've got see, a lot of abuse. Yeah, well, I would see Ramonas literally yeah. say, if you voted for Brexit, unfriend me now, because I want nothing yeah. to do with you ever again. I got, I got fake reviews on TripAdvisor for my pubs because I was so vocal about Brexit. Yeah. I mean, crazy. Having right. said that, we shouldn't forget there are nasty, very, very nasty right-wing people. And, mm. and it would be stupid to have this debate without acknowledging that. I know. And saying, on both sides. There, there are, but there are... And, and, of course, the things that the Labour Party or the left-wing accuse all Tories of mm. is a thing that some right-wing are guilty of homophobia, sexism, mm. racism. You know, we know that that is, Every that is the case. Every party has an element of that in it. But to tar a whole party with the mm. kind of brush that Labour do... But all I'm going to say, you're never going to get a Tory in this country who says they don't want to be friends with someone on the left. Mm. And from the current Labour Party, you get that a lot. Yeah. Mm. They That's simply uh, do uh, not I'd want... Am I right that John Macdonald also said that the, the Tory should be hounded in the streets? Is, was that a quote from him? Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, it was. It, it yeah. was. He did, so he did, he did, he did say that, didn't he? So and, and those he... sort of comments now with what's gone on, yeah. it's so hypocritical. It is. Well, it is. It's, it's, it's the height of hypocrisy. I mean, look, earlier today, the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss arrived in Moscow, where she will no doubt uh, try to have her Maggie Thatcher moment, which she did unfortunately <laughs> miss out on in Ukraine last month. Uh, but it doesn't look like, oh, look, there she is. There was Maggie in 87. <laughs> There's Liz Truss. Do you think she saw that, that picture, Amanda? Of or, course or, or, she or, did. Or do you think it's just Of course she did. But, I mean, she looks like a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> Compare her to Margaret Thatcher. I think I she mean, looks amazing. Oh, you do not. I you think, think Margaret Thatcher looks in amazing. Liz Wee Truss. In Liz in Wee Hannah. Truss, she's got to sort this out. <laughs> but it doesn't look like she's going to get her turn around Putin's big table like Macron did. Now, the now viral <laughs> image of the Ukraine <laughs> talk between the Russian President Vladimir Putin and Emmanuel Macron over the, the Ukraine crisis have been widely mocked on social media. Users were quick to dock to the picture, resulting in some amazing memes from Putin and Macron playing <laughs> a game of air hockey to decide the fate of Ukraine and join their time <laughs> on a seesaw. I love that one. Or even sharing a meme oh, with, with Judas himself. The hilarious and viral memes, or memes, as I like to call them, thanks to Emma Collins, are a bit of light-hearted fun from the doom and gloom of a possible war with Russia. And while World War III hasn't entirely been averted, it is hoped that Macron's six-hour interrogation of Vlad will keep the dialogue going. But all I can say is at this rate, Liz Truss will be lucky if she gets a spot at the kiddies' table. Now, Amanda Patel, Adam Brooks, Daisy McAndrew, thank you. Do stand by there, because coming up, as Adele is branded a turf, I still can't believe this, for celebrating her womanhood at the ultra-woke, genderless, flop Brit Awards, should the Brits and all other award shows abandon their gender-neutral plans? That and more of the front pages coming up at 10.30.
But next, as freedom convoys head to Brussels to show their love of liberty on Valentine's Day, are the world's truckers about to become our unlikely saviors from COVID authoritarianism? The original Canadian convoy spokesman and organizer Benjamin Dicta joins me for an exclusive interview about the honking being heard all around the world. Don't go anywhere, that's straight after the break. Hello, I'm Alex Deakin. Welcome to your latest update from the Met Office. Some wintry weather across Scotland, strong winds and some snow flurries as well. And across Northern Ireland, it could turn quite icy tonight. There's a cold front across the south of England. That's bringing a bit of rain and drizzle here and there. But it's further north where we've got the cold air already and the combination of these weather fronts and this area of low pressure that could bring some pretty nasty conditions to parts of Scotland. We do have Met Office yellow warnings in place. Snow and strong winds combining to make blizzards. So some pretty grim traveling conditions across Scotland, travel disruption possible, and ice is a big hazard across Northern Ireland where the showers will continue here. Elsewhere, apart from a bit of drizzle on the south coast, most of England and Wales will be dry, not quite as mild as recent nights, but still for most above freezing. But the wintry weather will still be there in the morning across Scotland and Northern Ireland. Ice for Northern Ireland, the combination of strong winds and snow across parts of Scotland, particularly the higher routes and travel disruption likely. But even through the central belt, it will get very windy and the winds themselves could cause some disruption. But certainly the combination of snow and strong winds making for some pretty grim travelling conditions during Thursday. A few showers will affect Northern England where it will also be blustery, much of the south dry and bright. Temperatures around average, feeling colder in the south compared to recent days and certainly feeling colder with the winds across Scotland and North East England, which will slowly ease during the course of the night. And then with clear skies and lighter winds, it's going to turn frosty for pretty much all of us as we head into Friday. Still some wintry showers in the far north, so it could be icy here on Friday morning. But for many places, Friday is a, a day of sparkling winter sunshine. It'll cloud over a little from the west. There may just be one or two scattered showers, but for most, Friday looks dry and fine. Temperatures close to average, but the winds won't be as strong on Friday. But certainly it'll be a cold and frosty start. The weather warnings are all on the Met Office website if you want more details. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Now, the inspiring Canadian trucker convoy for freedom has sparked positive, peaceful protest across the globe. The latest is in New Zealand and a European contingent is set to take their cause to the heart of the EU by blockading Brussels on Valentine's Day. 
Plus, the occupation continues in the Canadian capital city, Ottawa, despite strong opposition by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. So, as their honks are heard across the globe, are the world's truckers going to be the people to lead us out of all this COVID tyranny? I think they're making a huge difference, and it's damn inspiring stuff. Joining me now is one of the organisers and a spokesperson for the trailblazing Freedom Convoy in Canada, Benjamin Dicta. Benjamin, so great to have you here. Did you have any idea of the impact your convoy would have all across the world? Well, first, thank you for having me. It's an to be speaking to people in one of my favourite countries in the world. It's great to have uh, no, you. No, we, uh, we had no idea. It was... I don't want to say an act of desperation, but it did It did certainly feel like that when it started. Um, there were some convoys that were run a couple of years ago with some moderate success, but unfortunately, they got involved with political parties and then it quickly died. And this time we decided, you know what, let's just go full force. Let's get everybody united as much as possible and let's see where it goes. And, you know, one town after another town, we would see people on the overpasses with Canadian flags and freedom and we love you. It was absolutely amazing. And I think a part of it is, you know, people have had their lives decimated for the past two years with COVID lockdowns, with poor economic decisions, and people just needed an outlet. They needed to get out. And finally, a group of hardworking class people stood up and we said, well, we have the means, we have the resources, let's lead it and see who follows. And everybody came on board. And you know what's beautiful about it? It's not a politically partisan uh, issue. It's n there are people from across the political spectrum that have come on board. There are people in you know, different regions of Canada where we've historically, since our foundation, been at odds with each other, Quebec and Ontario, specifically but Quebec and Alberta, since uh, Pierre Trudeau really is what caused the division between those parts of the countries. Well, the, when I arrived here, I couldn't believe this. I saw people holding Quebec flags, you know, the separatist flag, the Fier Lady, and the Canadian flag walking together up Parliament Hill to meet with their fellow Canadians from Alberta and the Prairie Provinces. And they hugged each other, they got to know each other, they had the same signs, you know, one had freedom, the other had liberté, and they just became friends. It's just the most well, I love beautiful that. feel. I, I love that, and I think you're completely right. Uh, when it comes to COVID tyranny, when it comes to our civil liberties, this is not a left or right issue, it is a right or wrong issue. Now, I spoke last night, uh, Benjamin, with Justin Trudeau's brother, Kyle Kemper. Yes. And he had some thoughts on what the Canadian Prime Minister's motivation could be. So I want to play this to you and I'll then get you to react off the back. He is representing a pharmaceutical agenda and a World Economic Forum, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates kind of agenda that is decidedly un-Canadian and it wasn't ever voted on. Canadians never voted for vaccine mandates. So believe it or not, that's Trudeau's half-brother. Trudeau has, has tried to dismiss you guys as racists, as criminals, as, as troublemakers. Uh, what is the Prime Minister of Canada trying to do here? It's so divisive. Well, what other argument does he have? And it's, it's sad because you want a leader, irrespective of your political differences, is supposed to take everybody under the umbrella and represent all of us. And he's done the complete opposite. It's just constant doubling down on division. And it's really disheartening to the point where even people from his, his own base are starting to think, you know what, maybe this guy was a mistake and he doesn't get it because his, history is full of examples of what happens when a leader starts to malign its people and divide its people. And it can get very, very dangerous. Canadians are a very peaceful people, except for when we're playing hockey. But otherwise, we're very peaceful. <laughs> and that's what we, we want to unify. There's such a thirst for this movement of freedom and unity. That's why everybody is so happy. That's why nobody is uh, in any way aggressive towards one another. 
they're just ha like the people who walked across the bridge from Quebec in Ontario, they were under, under some of the most authoritarian restrictions in the Western Hemisphere. The fact that they could just come outside and not be harassed by the police, that was enough to put a smile on their face for an entire week. No, indeed, I can't believe what's been going on in Canada. I think the restrictions are just completely despicable. Uh, Benjamin, can I just get uh, the latest on what is actually happening in Ottawa? Because from what I'm hearing, there is still a few hundred truckers uh, who are remaining in place. The authorities are trying to confiscate fuel, but members of the public are secretly being able to provide the truckers more fuel. Is that right? So can you just explain to me what's happening in Ottawa and what's the plan? Okay, well, it's it's much more than a few hundred trucks, that's for sure. If you can see oh, that great. long line along Wellington and all the peripheral streets, there's thousands of trucks. Amazing. And then there's thousands of trucks off-site on farmlands parked, ready to go for shift duty to take over if this goes on for months and months. Um, right now, it's the middle of the week, and what we, we're seeing is there's somewhat of a pattern. People come in for the weekend because it's a festival-type atmosphere, and they're singing and music and dancing. Uh, this becomes the outlet for people on the weekends. And then during the week, it dies down a little bit, and there's you know a little bit of chatter and politician, politis, politicians posturing, and I don't say that pejoratively. Um, trying to figure out where they're going to go. We're seeing a lot of jurisdictions in Canada now where they are rolling back or, or laying out plans to roll back and then saying it has nothing to do with truckers, you know. <laughs> and it has time. everything we to don't... do with truckers. And and we know that. OK, but, but while the restrictions remain in place, yeah. your Freedom Convoy remains in Ottawa. That's right. That's right. We're still here. But also what's occurred is that's inspired convoys across the country yeah. that have gone and sealed multiple borders. And the fisheries have sealed many of the ports on the maritime. So now you got fisher, you got truckers, farmers, and people from the fishing industry, the fisheries, all joining together in mass to say, this is enough. If you want to lock down the country, we're going to show you what a lockdown is. Well, look, keep it up because it's absolutely inspiring what you're doing. It's going to come to Brussels on Valentine's Day. The truckers are currently outside the Parliament of New Zealand, where Jacinda Ardern has been following uh, the Trudeau playbook, and it is all because of you guys. So congratulations. That was the organiser and spokesperson for the trailblazing Freedom Convoy in Canada, Benjamin Dicta. Now, coming up, after politicians stuck an unwelcome oar into the Jimmy Carr traveller joke row by calling for him to be cancelled, are we in danger of becoming a censorship state like China? Silky Carlo of Big Brother Watch is fighting back against a bill that could make bad taste gags as well as dissenting views on COVID illegal. She's uncancelled at 1040. But next, should the Brits and all other awards show abandon their gender neutral plans after Adele called them out last night? And by the way, she's now been accused of being a turf by lefties. Oh my goodness, the world's gone mad. We will tackle that and give you a first look at some more of tomorrow's newspaper front pages as the media buzz continues straight after the break. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. 
And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud. Belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And let's return to tomorrow's news tonight now on our media buzz. More front pages in. The Daily Telegraph lead with the news that the police finally are going to contact the number 10 Downing Street party goers. Boris Johnson expected to be asked for his version of events after announcing today that self-isolation rules will soon come to an end. Also on the front page, families will face surge prices for using energy at peak times after Scottish Power EDF and Octopus Energy backed a revolutionary overhaul of the power market. That means that for 11 million customers, roughly a third of British households, their smart meters will automatically send half-hour hourly updates to suppliers about their household energy use. And as we mentioned earlier there, she yeah, so I was so distracted by that picture. Liz Truss, she's doing a Thatcher in Moscow and I am there for it. Love it. Good on her. And, and, and Liz, we trust. That's right. The Eye <laughs> also lead on police questioning 50 lockdown party goers as it reports that until this development, the PM's allies had hoped the immediate threat was over. Unfortunately not, as the mainstream media witch hunt continues at pace. Plus, uh, the paper, it's quite a hysterical paper, the eye actually, describes the PM's ditching of COVID regulations as a bonfire, as so-called experts say that Boris is wrong to do so. Well, let them burn, I say. Let those rules burn. The Guardian, like many of tomorrow's papers, leads on the scrapping of COVID rules, including the need for positive cases to self-isolate. I'm sure their woke editorial staff have been in a tiz about it all day. Uh, the newspaper quotes some scientists as being concerned that Boris Johnson's an announcement sends a sign that the pandemic is all over. Today's exclusive uh, from the Daily Mirror shows a leaked photo of Boris Johnson at a quiz night in number 10. Oh my goodness, they were doing a quiz on Zoom. And the bloke had a champagne. Just please move on. And Wagatha Christie herself, I'm more interested in this, <laughs> Colleen Rooney has revealed in a new documentary why she stayed with her bad boy footballer husband, Wayne Rooney, after he was unfaithful multiple times. Ka in the documentary which premiered tonight, the couple blamed alcohol for Wayne's cheating. The Sun lead on the RSPCA, and if you saw at the top of the show, I'm so relieved about this, stepping in to remove the scumbag footballer, Kurt Zuma's two pet cats genuinely have been so worried about these two little kitties because they needed to get out of that house. So well done for the RSPCA. And, and this scumbag should never be allowed to own an animal again. And, and what do we have here? What do we have here? The Daily Mail. Well, it covers the world leading shedding of COVID rules. But more importantly... Who's that? Our own superstar panellist, Amanda Platel, across the top, looking sultry with a very personal column. And Amanda Platel poses the tantalising question, as a betrayed wife, I was on Team Diana, so why have I forgiven Camilla? Amanda Platel, I'm here with Adam Brooks too, of course, <laughs> Daisy McAndrew. Amanda Platel, you traitor, you Diana traitor. I'm not, I'm sorry, you just have to get over yourself. You know, what if when you bother to read the thousand words I've written about this, <laughs> what I explain is that, yeah, my husband cheated on me, but I was a rotten wife. You know, I was not there. And Diana wasn't a rotten wife. She so was a rotten wife. Come oh. on. She became totally starstruck. Oh. She totally ignored him. If she wasn't chucking up in the toilet, she was having oh, some... I can oh, oh I'm from literally I bubbling am... with rage. Well, you can be rage. I love... 19-year-old virgin I... who was completely committed well, to a bloke who she had no idea was in love and having a long-term uh, affair I'm sorry. with another woman through their entire I, engagement. I was a virgin when I got married too. <laughs> oh, TMI. <my> <laughs> Can I just talk? Amanda, did they airbrush that picture? Oh, oh 
my dare God. dare you? <laughs> that was taken yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Compare and contrast, you, folks. That's like, that's like... You've done a great Amanda, job. Amanda, you need to hold it up next to your face. Is it the same? Where do I look? There you go. Mm -hmm. Before and after. It's the same. It's the same. <laughs> you are cruising <laughs> for a bruising. Now, anyway, look, have to move on. Yeah, sorry, have to move, move on. on. Sorry about that. Too That's... much about Amanda Blattel. <laughs> now, look, this is just so depressingly predictable, isn't it? Last night, the UK's biggest musical expert, Adele, spoke about her pride at being a woman as she picked up the British Award for Artist of the Year. The first gender-neutral gong of its kind after organisers decided to ridiculously axe those iconic best British male and best British female categories. This is what she said. So I would say, you know, I, I, I understand why the name of this award has changed, but I really love being a woman and being a female artist. I do. I do. And I'm, re I'm really proud of us. I really, really am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. She's right, of course, but just like J.K. Rowling before her, the woke hate mob are trying to cancel the Easy On Me singer for being a turf. Do you know this term? It's used to describe a feminist who excludes the rights of transgender women from their advocacy of women's rights. Now, I just think these people should put their pitchforks away, to be honest. The whole Brits debacle, though, should be a lesson to other award shows, the Oscars, the Grammys, whoever, who may be thinking of going woke. Because if the stars you're honouring don't like the bloody award they're winning and all you're doing is setting them up for trolling, it cannot be a good idea. And if they need any more convincing, the Brits once again proved that very important adage of go woke, go broke. Their most politically correct ceremony ever was watched by a record low of just 2.7 million viewers. Now that compares to 6.2 million a decade ago. And Daisy McAndrew, you have to admit, you have to admit this was a massive own goal by the Brits because what it also meant is you've got the other biggest music star in the world, Ed Sheeran, sitting there not winning any awards. They sort of gave him a pity prize at the start of the night. It was just <laughs> ludicrous. I think it's really, really difficult with this issue. And I totally understand why some people are all in favour of getting rid of you know, a single sex awards. But it sort of depends on what your motivation for that decision is in some ways. So if your motivation as it was when the Oscars and, and um, organisations like that originally brought in the, you know, the, the female, the, the actress award and the actor award. They did it to try to be inclusive because they realised that it was all men winning all the awards and yeah. women weren't winning any awards, partly because there were no good roles yeah. for women. And right. if you look at best cinematographer, best producer, best director, they're still nearly always won well, of course, by and, men. And by the way, Amanda, this will happen with the Brits. It's just very lucky that Adele had released an album. But if Adele hadn't released an album, all of the main awards would have been won by men. I think I'm about to say the first nice thing I've ever said about Adele. Um, <laughs> I only ever shout at my um, Allegra, and it's when she comes on the radio. Oh, go I easy can... on her. It's not an I, Allegra. I, don't, don't, I can't. I can't. <laughs> 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 was, I, was thinking, I was thinking about Allegra Stratton. No, that's why they don't talk back to me. <laughs> Called Alexa, I, anyway. I just think, look, I, I'm not... But you a don't big, like it. What, you tell I'm, your Allegra to turn her off. I, I, th th and maybe that's why it doesn't. I'm giving her the wrong name. I just say, shut her up. Get her off. Oh, I love her. But I think, well, I don't. Um, and I'm the guest. <laughs> and, and but I just think what she did last night was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And 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 in that really simple yeah. moment when the you know even mm. though there were fewer eyes on her, she's a huge international mm. celebrity. And to say, I am proud of being a woman. But what, what, but Adam, and when, I think when will ITV more women learn, do Adam? That. When will you ITV that. learn, Adam? When will mm. ITV learn? Good Morning Britain, no one's watching it now. Mm. It is a far left show. You know, they have left wing politicians mm. hosting with a left wing presenter. No one is watching. Uh, you can't say Man of the Match now on ITV. Player of the Match. Match. To player of the Match. No, they did that at the weekend. It's now Player of the Match across rugby and football. And now, in their biggest, most successful award mm. show, they've literally destroyed it. Why are we we're pandering to such a small minority of people and we're changing society? For them, yeah. and that's look. I, I even think it's probably mostly the f the people that think it's fashionable to support this that are driving this. And, and I bet that a lot of way, gender Sam neutral Smith, people. Sam Smith yeah. is one of the main reasons why they changed mm. it. I say to Sam Smith, someone who I like a lot mm. and who I respect a lot, Sam Smith, it's up to you. 
if you want to enter your album into the female mm. category because you feel like you want to be considered a woman, fine. If you want to enter it into the male category, fine. But exactly, don't tear up a whole load of history mm. uh, simply well, to appeal A few to years ago, what really stars. angered me was when ladies and gentlemen were taking off the... Oh, yeah, uh, you can't say that. ...the underground. Can't say that now. Yeah. Um, because it might offend 0.01% of the population. Ridiculous. Now, look, as I've said many times before, I've yet to come across a healthy vegan. Uh, they're often <laughs> falling ill have terrible skin, they seem to faint a lot. Uh, but to be fair, I've never yet met New York's vegan mayor. I certainly wouldn't be voting for him, just for that reason, by the way, I wouldn't vote for a vegan. Eric Adams, who claims his plant-based diet cured his diabetes and even reversed blindness in one of his eyes. That's not even the most sensational claim he's made about veganism, though. The woke official made jaws drop this week by saying that cheese is just as addictive and destruction as heroin. Adams said, food is like a drug. You take someone on heroin, put them in one room and someone hooked on cheese, put in another room, I challenge you to tell me the person who's hooked on heroin <laughs> and who's hooked Maybe. on cheese. <laughs> now, Adams is pushing his plant-based agenda on the almost 8.5 million residents of New York. But wait for it. He's been exposed. He's not a real vegan. He eats seafood. Take a look. Eat a plant base centered life so you eat fish. i eat a plant based centered life and i'm not going down that hold on hold on hold on hold on please don't do that yelling out stuff with me i don't do it to you don't do it to me and i'm not going down this rabbit hole of what do you eat if you eat cake and it has eggs in it that you analyze it i'm not doing that the more plant based you eat the better and healthier you are that is my question to those who are following me around in restaurants, wondering what, what I'm ordering. You've described yourself as vegan, and there's <laughs> vegans who do not eat animal-based protein. Thank you. I answered the question. I answered the question. I answered you. Do you know what? I think the only thing worse than being a vegan is someone pretending <laughs> that they're a vegan. The bloke did eventually fess up, by the way, telling reporters I'm perfectly <laughs> imperfect and have occasionally <laughs> eaten fish. <laughs> Remember that, folks. It's eat as I say, not as I do. <laughs> now coming up, the crowning moment of the show as Amanda Platel, Adam Brooks and Daisy McAndrew will coronate today's Greatest Britain and Union jackass. But first, as ministers alarmingly call for comedian Jimmy Carr to be cancelled for his Holocaust joke, are we in danger of becoming a censorship state? Close to the bone gags like that would be illegal under a terrifying new law which would also criminalise so-called COVID disinformation. Silky Carlo of Big Brother Watch is fighting back against the bill she describes as one of the greatest threats to the UK's free speech in living memory. So she's uncancelled in just a few seconds. First though, here's who's on the show tomorrow. Coming up on Dan Wooten Tonight, Reclaim leader and former actor Lawrence Fox is out of isolation and more determined than ever to take on the COVID-mad establishment in his first in-person interview since his brush with Omicron. Is the government already giving up on levelling up? Former Minister for the Northern Powerhouse Jake Berry weighs in. Plus, legendary US journalist Megyn Kelly and GB News star Mark Dolan are let loose, and I'll break down the headlines of the day with my superstar panel. Former Tory, London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey, conservative commentator Dominique Samuels, and the author and journalist Amy Nicole. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. Looking forward to that, but it's time now for Uncancelled. And this is where Britain's top commentators speak out on controversial issues without the fear of the cancel culture sweeping the rest of the media. Comedian Jimmy Carr has faced furious backlash for his, I guess you'd say, bad taste, Holocaust gypsy joke. But the politicians weighing in have raised a few eyebrows. Health Secretary Sajid Javid alarmingly called for the public to cancel Carr, while Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries made this chilling suggestion that close-to-the-bone gags could soon be illegal. Another bill that we have um, to come through is um, a media bill which we are looking at including those video on demand uh, streaming organisations such as Netflix. We're looking at including those into, into the scope of that bill to make the kind of comments that Jimmy Carr made, which I believe were a year ago, um, also um, subject to uh, to a new law which will impose sanctions upon those organisations. 
Doris is also talking about making COVID disinformation illegal as part of the new online safety bill. But as we've seen over the course of the pandemic, fake news on coronavirus has come from all angles, including, by the way, government scientists when it comes to controversial issues such as the efficacy of masks and the vaccine. And you can bet only one side of the argument will fall victim to this law. Director of Big Brother Watch, Silky Carlo, is leading a petition to stop the bill she describes as one of the biggest threats to UK democracy in living memory. And uh, Silky Carlo joins me now. So, Silky, obviously you could look at this and think the government are coming at it from a place of trying to help people. Uh, they want to protect people from harms online. But I guess your problem is as soon as you open up that Pandora's box, you're entering the world of censorship. Yes, exactly. Well, we, we already have laws that protect people from um, unlawful content and criminal activity online. And I think that's what most people care about when they're victims of fraud or from stalking and harassment um, and kind of s sexual crimes that can, can take place online as well. Um, but that's not what we've got here. We've got one of the most seriously dangerous bills for free speech in this country in living memory. Um, and it's become a bill where, as you can see, even over the past week, politicians are just lobbing on new types of content that they want to have the power to censor. They're not talking about um, speech that is just unlawful. They're talking about speech which is termed as harmful. And this is a completely elastic term, a new term. It's a completely new way of envisaging um, the state's intervention in what people can and can't say. Um, and harm is a very, very broad concept. As you can see now, we've got politicians saying that anything from bad jokes to inconvenient information or, or disinformation, as it's, as it's been called, as you quite rightly say, um, is, um, you know, often, it's often a term actually levelled um, at people who oppose government policies. Mm. Um, and this is the type of stuff that's, that's about to fall in the crosshairs. By the way, um, Big Brother Watch had a video censored um, by by oh, yeah, YouTube, that, that was by David Davis MP, yeah. one of the most you know celebrated civil liberties advocates in the country, because he was criticising COVID passes, um, and we had to fight to get that uncancelled. Um, so this is a real threat that could completely change the landscape for free speech in Britain. I mean, a bad joke being illegal, that is genuinely terrifying. I also shudder to think of the amount of time that police will use investigating these spurious things instead of actually focusing on knife crime and, and burglaries. I mean, it just feels like the priorities are so wrong. Absolutely. I mean, um, conviction rates and uh, are going, uh, are absolutely plummeting. Um, crime rates are going up. Um, and there are some serious internet-based crimes, but it's not really bad jokes or offensive opinions. And already I think we have a problem in this country now where police officers are going to speak to people to check their thinking about things that they've posted online that are kind of ordinary, widely held opinions. Um, if we throw open the floodgates, as this new bill proposes to do, to capture entirely new categories of speech as things that should be in the crosshair for, for state authorities to have a say on, um, then we really are through the looking glass. I think already people in this country are starting to feel that we've had enough of being told what we can and can't say, um, that we've had enough of cancel culture. That's why we've got this petition that I would encourage people to sign, to, to let the government know that we do want to protect free speech online. My sense is that the government thinks that it can get away with this or that people just don't care. And I think that's a real misreading of the situation. Actually, I think there are millions of people out there who, who really hold dear the precious British tradition of free speech um, in this country and realise that it is the foundation of democracy. I think there are some people in politics who are trying to recast it as a danger to democracy, which is absolute nonsense. It's, it's what our democracy is based upon. So, Silky, okay, I'm with you on pretty much all of this. Uh, but the one question I do have for you is about the big tech companies. Uh, so the Facebooks, uh, the Googles, the Twitters, the Snapchats. Now, they claim they're not publishers. And so they're not held accountable for anything. 
that is published on their platforms. And remember, that does mean we have seen things published like instructions to terrorists on how to make bombs, revenge porn of young teenage girls at schools. And the problem with these companies, Silky, and remember, I've dealt with them a lot, they won't always take this stuff down. And that's the only area where I just feel like there has to be some acknowledgement that these companies need to be accountable to someone because they're not even in this country. Mm. I couldn't agree more, actually. Um, and I think that this bill, the online safety bill, um, is being branded by the government as reining the tech companies in, when actually it's doing precisely the opposite. It's empowering foreign companies who don't share British free speech values to act as speech police online mm. over lawful content. Mm. I think you're absolutely right. I think if the government had come forward with a bill that dealt with specifically lawful, uh, unlawful content, and said to the big tech companies, if you are keeping up criminal content yeah. on the because internet... Because they do, by the way. Yeah. They do keep up criminal content. It, it, yeah, it has happened. Yeah. If you're keeping up and you're not taking it down, then that will be a, a matter for the authorities. That would be absolutely okay. right, but no, that's not what No, I think that's a good villain. solution, actually, and I wish they were going down that path. Well, look, a really important issue. Do keep us posted, please. That was the director of Big Brother Watch, Silky Carlo. Silky, thank you so much. But time now to reveal today's greatest Britain and union jackass. <laughs> My superstar panel back with me, Amanda Patel, your nomination for Greatest Brit. Dame Judi Dench it is. If she wins this Oscar for the movie Belfast, she'll be the oldest ever actor um, to win. And she is the queen of movies in this country. And she was have to get the queen in somewhere. incredible <laughs> in this film. I think we've got a little look at her, actually. You can see the moon's made of green cheese and drop down. Up well, you could do the project together, you and the young lady. You get the same marks and maybe end up on the same seat together. I, I honestly, that movie made me bawl my eyes out. She's not nominated for a BAFTA, which is an outrage. She should win the Oscar. Adam Brooks, your nominee. It's uh, Boris Johnson uh, <laughs> for lifting all the restrictions a month early. I've been highly critical of him. Yeah, you uh, have. But we've got to celebrate the. But we've got to celebrate it, it and we've got to give him credit. And Daisy McAndrew, your nominee. Uh, mine is Gitto Harry, the new um, comms chief for Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who, uh, of course, was a former colleague uh, here at TV News. But I am nominating him not for that, but because that takes gumption to take on that job that nobody else wanted. So I'm applauding him for his balls. <laughs> oh, he's got balls, right? <laughs> Do you know what? I love all three of those nominations, but I'm going to go with Boris Johnson today. Because Thank you, Dan. I have been highly critical, like Adam has, when he's got COVID wrong, so we have to celebrate when he gets it right. Union Jackass time now. Amanda Patel, your nominee. Well, even though he's not English, he plays for an English team, Kurt Zuma. And, and well done, Adidas, um, for withdrawing the sponsorship of his boots, because who can flog um, boots when they're being seen to be drop-kicking a cat across the mm, kitchen a revolt. floor? Absolutely disgusting, man. Adam Brooks, your nominee. Mine is the Daily Mirror newspaper. Uh, what have yes they done? Yesterday, they uh, misrepresented the death figures uh, and made it look like deaths had uh, spiked 43% uh, by ignoring a quirk in the uh, data the, follow uh, the Tuesday before. So it, it was scaremongering and it was irresponsible Very journalism. Bad. Uh, and Daisy McAndrew, your nomination for well, Zuma. Jackass. Sticking with Amanda's theme, I'm nominating David Moyes for playing Zuma last night. I thought that was a really disgusting decision. Clearly, um, only going for the bottom line and wanting to win. Then, funnily enough, Vitality, their biggest sponsor, has withdrawn sponsorship from the whole team today. And guess what? He's been dropped from Sunday's game. And I think that tells you all you need to know about David Moyes' motivation. Indeed. Well, look, all great nominees again, but I'm going to go with Kurt Zuma himself. Completely agree about David Moyes, by the way, Daisy, but I think he was probably put in an impossible just position by West Ham. What a great panel tonight. Amanda Platel, Adam Brooks, Daisy McAndrew, thank you so much. Thank you for your company too. Remember, I'll be back again tomorrow night from 9pm. Headliners is next here on GB News. Good night. Hello, I'm Alex Deakin. Welcome to your latest update from the Met Office. Some wintry weather across Scotland, strong winds and some snow flurries as well.
And of course, Northern Ireland could turn quite icy tonight. There's a cold front across the south of England. That's bringing a bit of rain and drizzle here and there. But it's further north where we've got the cold air already and the combination of these weather fronts and this area of low pressure that could bring some pretty nasty conditions to parts of Scotland. We do have metal.